Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Judy Melanick, a forensic pathologist in the San Francisco Bay Area. We talk about what the coronavirus epidemic looks like from the perspective of a medical examiner. A warning that this podcast contains some graphic descriptions of autopsy procedures and bereavement that some listeners may find disturbing. Let's listen. Thank you, Dr. Melanick, for joining me today. Um, Could you just start by explaining a little bit uh, what a forensic pathologist does? A forensic pathologist is a doctor who specializes in doing autopsies in order to figure out why people die. Now, why would why would a forensic pathologist um, have a special uh, relationship to a pandemic? There are two ways where a forensic pathologist um, might be involved in a response to a pandemic. One is when someone who dies at home, for instance, because they're quarantined, or uh, because they've been isolating themselves socially in order to protect themselves um, or to protect others, might die in their residence. And the death is a solitary death, in which case um, it might not be found right away. Or when they're found, there isn't someone to necessarily tell us why the person died. So the death is unexpected. Um, And then that body might come into our office and we won't necessarily know that they've been exposed to the virus or that they've been um, sick, but we still have to figure out why they died. And so, so it, so just sorry to interrupt, but so it's not that um, medical examiners uh, or coroners where forensic pathologists work are required to do an autopsy on everybody who might die from the novel coronavirus, but that You generally do autopsies on unexplained uh, deaths, and some of those people may well have the novel coronavirus. That is correct. And also, now that there's community spread, people still die of suicides and homicides and other motor vehicle accidents. But if they're carrying the virus, we could potentially be exposed to that as well. So that's another scenario where our staff... um, who are performing autopsies and doing invasive procedures um, in a medical setting where they could be um, exposed to respiratory pathogens um, and have to protect themselves. So we have to also have to keep that in mind. But then there's one other scenario, which is that when the healthcare systems get overloaded and there are too many deaths and family members are not picking up the bodies from the hospital for funerals because they're not having funerals, or they're uh, financially strapped because of the economic effects of the lockdowns and the pandemic, they're not going to necessarily take responsibility for the deceased. And in that case, the medical examiner's office has a public health function in arranging for disposition of the remains of those that cannot be taken care of by their next of kin. So there's or may sort not of like a, have next of kin. It's sort of like a mass casualty role, in other words. Correct. Correct. So we have both roles, both the diagnostic role to figure out why people died and participate in writing death certificates that are accurate for public health purposes, but also the role of uh, disposition of the remains, even when we know why they died, even if they died, for example, in a hospital setting. And the doctor at the hospital writes the death certificate, but now nobody's going to pick up the body. So then we have that civic role on behalf of the uh, government entity for that jurisdiction. I want to circle back on both of those things, which are pretty both pretty intense roles, um, and just ask you as a pathologist, the pathologist part of forensic pathologist, um, what happens when people die of the novel coronavirus? Um, I understand it's a pneumonia. What, what would you see on an autopsy? So there are many things that you could potentially see in a novel coronavirus death. I mean, the first thing we have to acknowledge is that, uh, at least from the data coming out of uh, both China and Italy, um, a large percentage of the deaths occur in people who are older. 
So they will have underlying medical conditions, what we call comorbidities is the medical term. That would include things like heart disease or diabetes or asthma or um, COPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So we'll have that baseline underlying medical condition to begin with. And then on top of that, there will be a lung infection that uh, spreads and uh, solidifies the lungs so that normally the lungs, when you look at a normal lung with the naked eye, when you do an autopsy, it's like a pink sponge. It's squishy. It um, uh, doesn't have a lot of fluid in it. It's just a, a very spongy, light material. And when there's pneumonia, that spongy light material becomes mu much more dense. It looks more like liver, um, like a thick, meaty uh, substance. And there's no uh, uh, air anymore in it because the air spaces have been filled with uh, a combination of fluid and inflammatory cells. So that's, that's the effect to the naked eye when you're doing the autopsy. And then under the microscope, you can see the damage to the lung tissues by the inflammatory cells that have filled up those air spaces and sometimes start to remodel it. And um, that is uh, unique to the coronavirus, or is this sort of like an end stage that many different conditions can cause, but we just see it a lot with, the, with this new virus? It is something that we can see with lots of other viruses as well. So it's typical of uh, the influ influ influenza can do this as well. Uh, SARS can do this as well. The other SARS viruses have done it. Um, but it's just that disproportionately this is happening in this particular virus compared to the others in terms of the effect on the population. Um, you know, you'll sometimes see cells that have uh, viral inclusions, they're called. They just have very uh, big nuclei. They look a little unusual. And that's a tip off that this is a viral process and not necessarily a bacterial process. But as you know, you can also have bacterial super infection because once you have a virus enter your system and damage your lungs, then bacteria can also uh, set up shop because your the damage has already been done and the, there's a breakdown in the immune system. So bacteria can also cause a super infection of the lung as well. And all of these can be seen in, in novel coronavirus. What would be the cause of death that you would write on the death certificate? Typically, we would write, um, a, you know, ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, due to novel coronavirus. We'd identify the specific pathogen, and then we'd probably put under uh, the second part of the death certificate, which is called other significant conditions contributing to death, and that's where we would place things like underlying heart disease or lung disease that predispose the person uh, to the infection. Thank you. Well, I want to go back to the other couple um, topics we discussed. But first, I want to ask you, have you had to do a death certificate like that as yet in this uh, situation? Uh, to date, not yet. Um, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we've had, uh, in California, just to give you a perspective where we are to date, we've had uh, 1,435 confirmed cases in California, and uh, 646 of those were in the Bay Area. But in the jurisdictions where I uh, work, uh, we have not yet had a death that came to our office or that was uh, documented on the websites as being attributed to COVID. I imagine you're preparing for the possibility, if not the likelihood. Yes. In fact, I was working on protocols today. So um, let's talk about that, which is um, how you protect people who work in your office, um, given that there could well or almost certainly well be people who are coming in, like you said, um, for example, because they may have been in a car accident or some other usual way of dying, but it turns out that they have the novel coronavirus. What, uh, how are those um, uh, decisions made about uh, how to protect the people who work there? So luckily online, <laughs> there are available resources, both uh, available from the CDC and OSHA, Office of Safety and Health Administration, and uh, the World Health Organization has also published uh, guidelines for healthcare workers. And so we're, I, I was spending most of today going through the guidelines and trying to find the best practices. Yeah. In addition, we can reach out to other people. I and mean, this is a wonderful time period to be living in where we're all interconnected. And uh, we have a professional organization called the National Association of Medical Examiners uh, in the United States. And there are a lot of international members, and some of them have been kind enough to share their protocols with us as well. So um, at the very least, we'd be using, you know, people have heard the term N95 respirators. That's what we'd be uh, using to protect our airway, covering our nose and mouth. We'd need a face shield. And um, 
in the absence of N95 respirators, another option is a positive airway pressure respirator, which is like the moon suit, which goes over your head like a hood and um, has a blower with a filter that filters the air that you breathe. And you, you all are getting ready for that right now, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah, so we're mobilizing at, at the present. We're trying to, you know, keep, I, I want to get uh, inventories so I know how much we have of everything and uh, so that we can utilize our resources or order more um, if need be, if they're available. I mean, I, I understand that there are shortages throughout the country right now in uh, key districts that have been uh, uh, over, you know, starting to get an influx of patients. And we just don't want to be overwhelmed. We want to be on top of things. Got it. Um, and then the other topic you mentioned briefly was the sort of mass casualty role of medical examiners um, in, in this circumstance. Um, how does that work? Well, anytime someone dies in, uh, whether it's a hospital setting or even at home, and they don't have next of kin, or their next of kin uh, don't have the resources, the financial resources to uh, arrange for burial and disposition of their property, uh, that role falls on the government. And we have... Right. But but I guess what I'm asking is what happens if you have, you know, a lot of um, unclaimed uh, uh, people, you know, what, what, what do you, I mean, how does that work from that point? Like, do you um, arrange for cremation? Do you, like, what, what actually happens? Different offices deal with it in different ways. Um, some of it is cultural. You know, there are some regions where they'll have uh, places where you can bury bodies and you can do uh, uh, burial plots. And then maybe when families get their wherewithal or get their financial assets together, they can still we can still identify, well, this person is in this plot so that they can take the remains and have it buried in the cemetery at like some later point. Um, but um, in California, we actually use cremation quite a lot. Um, so there are options for direct cremation that can be arranged as well. Um, we'd be part, partnering with mortuaries um, in the region, but a lot of it depends on how they're doing and whether they're overwhelmed. So we're just going to have to take it day by day, at least in the interim. Um, we're arranging for uh, getting uh, access to refrigerated trucks so that if there is a large influx of deceased, we have a place to at least store them temporarily until we decide uh, where they're going to be interred. And uh, have you had a sense of how this is going, for example, in Italy, where they've had you know, so many more fatalities than they expected? I, I mean, at least n not any more so than you do from the news reports yeah. that they're, you know, taking military trucks and with bodies in order to uh, bury them because the cemeteries are overloaded. So that's uh, the problem uh, as well. And it, uh, my understanding, there was a re news report, again, I don't know how accurate it was, but coming out of Iran that they were digging mass graves that were visible from outer space. So I am hopeful that we're not going to have to go that route. Um, but I want to make sure that our offices are prepared if um, the casualty rate does get high enough that we'd have to consider something like that. Um, there's one other role of forensic pathologists we haven't talked about, but I've read about it in your book, which is to talk to the family about the cause of death. And, you know, that is a very uh, difficult thing to do, I'm sure, but it's very important for families. Have you thought about, you know, how you would um, talk to families in this situation? I mean, people uh, are obviously... Uh, aware, I guess, that this is out there and this could happen, but it's different than actually hearing it from a doctor and you're, you're the doctor who would tell people. Um, how do you begin to approach something like that? In this circumstance, things will be a little bit different just because we're dealing with a virus as opposed to we're dealing with, um, you know, a terrorist attack. You know, there, there there's mm -hmm. a distinction um, with a difference. Uh, you know, I I was in New York City for 9-11. Uh, I actually was there when I went into work that day on 9-11. I saw the first plane before it hit the World Trade Center. And I watched the mobilization of our office and the response to a mass fatality incident with refrigerated trucks and tents being set up and triage stations in order to identify people. Um, and there's a very similar feeling that I'm getting now about what we're uh, uh, going to experience, but it feels almost like a slow motion, like a slow motion 9-11 where the deaths are coming. It's just going to be slow and it's going to come upon us first slowly and then quickly. And so we have to be prepared now for the eventuality um, so that we're not caught trying to catch up later when the resources are already depleted. Mm -hmm. But you'll still have to um, tell people what the cause of death was and 
maybe confirm it if they already knew. And in some yeah. cases, it may be a surprise that like if someone died at home. Well, that's the thing. I mean, the other thing we have to consider is that because of the shelter in place order that we currently have in California, where we're not on total lockdown. I mean, people can go outside. So it's not exactly like Italy, but we have to social distance. We have to be six feet away from any, anybody who's not in our immediate family. But we have to also consider that if somebody dies suddenly and unexpectedly in the house, there may be other people in the house with them mm -hmm. who are also potentially exposed. So getting a diagnosis of uh, coronavirus versus something else right. being the cause of death is going to be very important so, to those people. I see. So this it adds to the challenge for you because it could mean that the person who's hearing the news is actually at risk themselves. Correct. Exactly. And wow. that changes the dynamic. So in our office where I work, um, most of the direct patient contact is done by the deputy sheriffs. But I, um, I, I would be the one to call up the families and let them know what the results of the testing is if that were done. Wow. Um, there is, uh, of course, um, the point that we don't know for sure how busy you're going to be. In fact, it really matters what people do in their daily lives today that will figure out how busy you are tomorrow. If people are listening, do you have a message for them in that regard? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that all of the public health measures that have been talked about, the social distancing, the um, staying six feet away from people, washing your hands um, thoroughly, uh, decontaminating things if you were outside, <laughs> then you're bringing them into your house that you know might have been um, coughed on or sneezed on by somebody else in the public realm. It's it's something to consider, and um, also just taking care of your basic health behaviors. To, you know, even though if you're on lockdown or um, in a shelter in place order, you can still take care of your mental health. You know, still get exercise, <laughs> still eat well. Because you don't want to see people for any reason, let alone. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, one of the scenarios that we were batting around as a hypothetical was, you know, family members um, who are stuck together in close proximity in the house. If there's a situation where there's domestic violence, it could end up being a right. coroner's case because of a homicide or because of a suicide. And um, it may not be a direct... Uh, COVID death, meaning right. it's not an infectious disease death, but it is related to the pandemic and that the scenario wouldn't have happened if these people weren't stuck together wow. for a prolonged period of time. So it's, it's something that we have to think about. Yeah, well, that, that's a even more depressing way of thinking about the coronavirus, um, which I did not think necessarily would have been possible. But I, um, I really thank you for joining me, giving us just sort of the hard facts about what this looks like uh, from your vantage point. Um, and uh, I really hope that we're able to do as much as possible to uh, leave you as little work as possible. So um, that, that, that's definitely my hope. And thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate being invited. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for listening to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.